sisters. I cannot imagine having five sisters and two brothers. I have enough trouble with my one. People often described Katie as a genuinely warm person who loved to help other people. But Katie's mom says as much as she loved people, she loved animals more. She said Katie enjoyed life. She had this heart of gold and she would do anything for anyone. And she described her daughter as being able to befriend even a cricket if she could. She loved animals so much. Patricia said, you won't find anyone sweeter or kinder than Katie. And that just breaks my heart. I could just imagine her like the little cricket from Milan. Breaks my heart. All these cases break my heart. So, in 2015, Katie pursued her degree at Greenfield Community College, and she had a part-time job working at a place called Firehouse Subs. Do you guys have Firehouse where you live? We have one nearby, and sometimes it's really good, and sometimes it's not, but, you know, I think all restaurants are kind of like that. So she was working there, going to college, and trying to figure out her life. She knew she wanted to work with animals, but I get the impression she wasn't sure just exactly how she wanted to do that. So while she's working at Firehouse as a sandwich maker, she meets this man and she described him as striking, and they kind of become friends, and he is 28-year-old Army Staff Sergeant John, and I'm sure I'm going to say his name wrong, even though I looked it up. I think it's Blauvelt. He worked next door at the Army Recruiting Facility, and he would often come into the firehouse for lunch, and he quickly made friends with Katie, and she was just completely taken by John. Her friends say that she felt like this instant connection to him because her family had several military connections, so she really felt like she could relate to his kind of lifestyle. Now, she worked at this firehouse with her niece, Cheyenne, and Cheyenne would remember that their relationship kind of sparked. She says, Katie's my aunt. She is my mom's younger sister. Katie and I were four years and one week apart. So we were a little more like sisters instead of aunt and niece. And as for John, he would come in there and get lunches. When I first met him, he was in the army, so I figured he would be a pretty nice guy. And John, well, he may have seemed nice. And he had 10 years of active military duty. But John was allegedly, I'm not going to say allegedly, he was, he was a cheater. Let's just be straight out with it. Katie and Cheyenne discovered that he was married. And not only was he married, he was still living with his wife and their young daughter. Now, he said, oh, we're in the process of getting a divorce. And they were planning to move separately soon. And Katie was so enthralled with John that she just was like, okay. Patricia, her mother, really didn't want Katie to get involved with John until he was divorced. She felt like it was wrong. And you know, you can get into a lot of trouble in the military if they find out that you are cheating on your spouse. But as I said, Katie was just enthralled by him and she believed him. So she started dating him and 
separated and see how things went. But Katie was happy and very, very attracted to him, Cheyenne said. So,
really uncomfortable and it definitely upset her and caused some rifts in their relationship. She would constantly ask him to stop giving these kids drugs and alcohol, but he would ignore her and go about his own business and tell her to mind her own. But of course, things got out of hand. One of the kids' parents found out about these parties and they called the police. And I totally get that. I would be extremely upset if that was my kid. So the police basically, I don't know if the word raided is the right choice. So they show up at the door and John refuses to let them in. And it actually becomes this eight hour standoff where he is telling these kids to be quiet. He tells the police that they have no right to enter his home and they have no right to question his actions in his own home. The police don't see it this way and so they get a search warrant and they enter John's house and John gets arrested. He is arrested for supplying alcohol and drugs to underage kids. And when he's in prison, they learn more about his and Katie's relationship. They learn that he is extremely violent and he had even threatened to kill Katie. They had gotten into this massive fight and he wanted her to unlock her phone and let him read her messages. And Katie was like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing anything wrong. You're not getting into my phone. She did not want to give up her privacy. But her disobedience infuriated him, basically, and he pointed a gun at her. But Katie was a brave girl, and she refused to budge, and so John, um, uh, he's a narcissist, he says, fine, I'll commit suicide, and she's like, no, you won't, she says, whatever, I'm still not giving you my phone, he then threatens extreme violence and says he will kill everyone that she knows and loves. So after that incident, Katie really tried to stay away from John. She was terrified and she wanted nothing to do with this crazy man. So she moves back home with her parents. However, John wielded immense power over her and he controlled her actions and Katie found it suffocating to be in the same town as him. She was worried about running into him and he seemed to kind of show up in the oddest places. Um, she wasn't really sure how he knew she was there. So she files this domestic violence complaint against him. Katie never got the chance to file for divorce, but the two of them were separated. They maintained minimum contact, and Katie really tried to stay away from him. Now, John, of course, can't be alone, so he moves on to this other relationship that you may have heard of. It is with 17-year-old Hannah Thompson, and she is actually, from the reports that I read, some of the reports that I read, the girl whose parents called the police on the party that John was having. So, she is in their house partying with him. She's 17, and then he strikes up a relationship with her after his wife leaves him. It's, it's bizarre. So, Hannah like cuts off her family, her friends. She's 17. She is enthralled with this man. He was good, I'm gonna say. He knew how to get people into his net. He takes advantage of this little girl and she is too naive and just enamored to realize that this is what is happening. So she separates herself from friends and family. And while this weird thing with John and Hannah is going on. Katie is trying to 
rebuild her life. She is continuing to work on her degree and she is getting ready to file for a divorce. But on October, I'm sorry, in October, I cannot see today, 2016, Katie gets a job at PetSmart. She starts to meet new people. She starts to make new friends and her life is getting better. So that leads us to October 24th of 2016. Cheyenne had called Katie and asked her if she wanted to grab dinner. But Katie sounded really off to Cheyenne. She told her that she wanted to take a drive and she just needed to think about some things. And Cheyenne asked her, well, like, where are you going? And Katie says, I don't really know. Cheyenne uh, relates that she didn't really think about it at the time, but she said she would be there to get us in an hour and we could go get food. Cheyenne replies, okay, tells her aunt that she loves her and hangs up the phone. While she's waiting for her aunt to come and get her, Cheyenne falls asleep. And when she wakes up, she realizes that several hours have gone by and she hasn't heard from Katie. And this makes Cheyenne kind of nervous. So naturally, Katie's family is worried. They start searching for her. They start calling her. They try to get a hold of her. And they can't. And they immediately believe that something is wrong. When uh, morning comes and Katie still has not come back or answered any phone calls, her family files a missing persons report. The police access Katie's cell phone pretty quickly and they find that her phone is located near an abandoned house. And this apparently was a place that Katie and her friends liked to have parties. At first I thought this was strange, but I guess, you know, when you're younger, that's, that's what you do. You party where your parents can't find you. And I live in kind of a big town, so we don't, or we didn't at that point, have places like that. But I guess, tell me, if you're in a small town, does that happen? So, Cheyenne and her friends ask around to see if maybe there was a party that they didn't know about and if someone had seen Katie, but no one fessed up to it. They got no leads. So Katie's family is frantic and they know that they are wasting precious time. The police are helping, but searching around is just not leading them anywhere. So the police obviously pinged her cell phone so they go to search this abandoned house. Katie's family doesn't know about this at this point. Um, but Katie's friends searched that abandoned house and their worst nightmares came true at this point. They find Katie and she is under a pile of construction debris and she has been stabbed fatally. The forensic team estimated her time of death around 8 p.m. on the day that she went missing. So someone had murdered Katie just a couple of hours after she had spoken with Cheyenne. I'm not really sure how the friends were at this abandoned house before the police were. I cannot imagine the terrible discovery that would be to find one of your friends murdered. I can't get my head around why the police were not there already preventing that. So police begin their investigation into this case and since John was technically still her husband, they have to inform him of her passing. Now, John was pretty lame. Um, he was very unemotional, very unconcerned. He basically told the police that their relationship was on the rocks and displayed no shock or sorrow at the fact that Katie had passed away. And the police found 
it was like the most amazing phone call ever. She told reporters that Katie's relationship consisted of intimate partner violence and she hoped that others could learn from her daughter's story. Here she will beat you one day and the next day apologize. Don't believe them. Katie got away from him and moved back home. But this person, they're not going to change. They threaten, they beat, and they hurt you. So get away and stay away. Now, uh, this is the part where I think I may have researched this story case and decided not to cover it because I think that he was still on the run whenever I researched it and I know that you guys don't like finished cases so I think I may have put it on the back burner and I almost did it again because as far as I could dig this man hasn't been sentenced yet he was literally caught less than a year ago um, in July of 2022 we are now in March of 2023 uh, you know that these things are not uh, fast moving I believe that he faces charges not only from the state but also from the military for going AWOL not just going AWOL but going AWOL with his weapons and other things I distinctly remember them finding Hannah and him not being there. I know that they hoped that Hannah could lead them to John, but I think that he maybe saw her as an hindrance, and that is why he left her, and I think that she is incredibly brave to speak out against him. She called her parents, and she went home, and I can only imagine what drama she suffered. Um, at the hands of this incredibly narcissistic person. I always have trouble reporting on domestic violence cases, being a domestic violence um, survivor myself. Um, my domestic violence was quite, quite similar to this case. I was involved with an active duty Air Force member who did many of these same things to me. Um, granted, he wasn't having parties and giving drugs to minors, and he never pointed a gun at me, but um, I, um, I wish that Katie could have gotten away and managed to just have her career and do whatever it was that she wanted to do. Um, I don't know. I just, it's horrible and discouraging sometimes to think about the world that we live in today. I always complain and it could be my fault, but my newsfeed is nothing but violence, nothing but true crime. It is all just want to see some happiness sometimes, if that makes sense. I would love to cover another survivor story on this channel, so if you have a good one, please drop it down below. Um, I don't want to cover, like, the Jamie Claus case, because I think we all know that one, but I do think that sometimes we could use a bit of a positive spin. Anyway, thank you guys so much so much for being here today. I hope you enjoyed this video and the airplanes were not too distracting. I know some of you hear them and some of you don't. There were a couple, I think, in this video, so hopefully not too crazy. I will be covering another true crime case over on Patreon this week, probably on Thursday, might be Wednesday, just depends on when I get the time and quiet to film. We are still dealing with some Lucy issues and I'm definitely going to have to have Sean edit this video in order to make sure you can't hear her crying over her little tooth. So. Um, I think that is all that I've got. Again, thank you guys for being patient with me. I know that I've not been posting as regularly. Um, it's
sucks. <laughs> it sucks for me. I know it sucks for you guys. I, I'm really trying. 